Startup Brian is designed to bring together entrepreneurs to create a forum where we can learn about each other um, in a little bit of a different way than some of the things that we may have seen before. Startup Grind was started in 2010 by Derek Anderson and Spencer Nielsen in California, in a garage where everything seems to start in California. Um, and basically there were some friends getting together, talking about business, talking about what worked, talking about what didn't work, um, and it grew. And so they moved out of the office, I think, into a garage, from a garage into a facility. Um, and soon he had people, Derek had people coming to him saying, can you bring this to my city? And so that's how it began to grow. And I got uh, involved with Startup Grind. Um, back in December, I, I was working with a business coach. And I was doing a research homework assignment and came across this website. And what really um, captured me were the values of making friends uh, and not just contacts. We have a lot of things, a lot of awesome events for entrepreneurs here in our area. But we don't really have anything that allows us to go into the story kind of behind the story. So we may know that folks are doing a great job. We may know that they are um, very successful in their field. But how do they get there? Um, I've been to many events where I sat in the audience and heard fantastic things from fantastic people. But I wasn't really sure how to bridge that gap between where I was to the people that were in the seat. And that's what Startup Grind allows us to do because it's an hour-long format. It's a question and answer. We call it a fireside chat. So we have a tradition at Startup Grind. And I'd like to ask all of you to help me. I'm looking at Mike, he's looking at me like, you're gonna do this, aren't you? <laughs> our tradition is that we ask everyone to just kind of rise to your feet and help me to welcome our guest of the evening, which is Mike Hickey, former CEO and uh, former president of Pitney Bowes, Math Info, uh, current executive in residence at Siena College. So if you all just kind of help me welcome Mike as he comes up. Are you going to make me sing or dance or something? <laughs> that's later. The dancing comes, that's the second part of the network. Okay. No, just kidding. Well, I'm just really, um, I'm excited that you agreed to come and, um, and be a guest with us. Um, you have, as many people know, uh, a really, an interesting story, a fascinating story. You've done a lot of things with a lot of different places. Um, but I think what, you've done so much that we could focus on a lot of different things. We could talk about you being an entrepreneur. We could talk about you being a, an investor. Um, but one of the things that you've done and are known for doing really is your business growing, your business strategy, um, really helping companies to expand, whether that's a, a local expansion, whether it's a merger. So I wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit if we could tonight. So um, you, I know that you're also uh, executive in residence at Siena, so maybe we can touch a little bit on that. I know there were some students that were going to register. I don't know if they actually came. But I always like to start um, with the human side of what happened. So I like to kind of chat a bit about um, your childhood. Was there, um, was there a person in your, in your life that stood out to you as someone that said, you know what, I kind of want to either emulate that person or I kind of want to, um, they, maybe they had a business. Was there someone that you remember from your childhood that kind of gave you that, yeah, I think mm -hmm. I want to I do something on my own? So this is going to prove to you this is not set up because my answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's why. Actually, there was. There wasn't anyone. Yeah. Okay, so that's. So but that's I, I would say this: I, I, I ran into my seventh grade social study teacher a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, and he was a superintendent of a school district. And um, he raised his hand when I was, I was up on stage talking about education, and uh, he said, "You remember me?" And of course, I did immediately. And he told the whole audience that um, that in seventh grade I told him I was going to be a CEO. So somewhere <laughs> along the line, I made up my mind. That's pretty amazing. So even even back at, at a time when perhaps on, not on a conscious level <laughs> that you remember, there isn't a, a story per se, but there was something in you. There was a seed that said a seed of, gre of greatness. We can say. Um, and as we, you know, I kind of look, I, I do my research, I, I start off, um, I'm so the not reinvent the wheel person, so I'm gonna look at what's out there. But then I wanna try and find something um, that's a little bit different. Uh, and again, we're talking about, you know, the personal side, the personal story. Um, you did, as you made the transition um, through uh, Map Info, uh, going into um, Pit and Bones. Um, and you really, there were some things that you did with that merger that really stand out. Those are, those are, you know, people talk about Mike Hickey when I began to ask questions about you. Those were some of the things. But it, it wasn't so much, it, it was, it was your, it was Mike the man that people seem to comment on. That you seem to have a way of bringing together um, what may be um, to separate groups of people. 
talk a little bit, if you can, um, about that, how that, you, you know, you were with Matt Thinpo, how that kind of that transition took place. Yeah, so I'm, it, you're talking about some tremendous challenges because if you think about it, so MapInfo was at the time probably a $190 million company, uh, 1,700 or so, I mean, excuse me, about probably 850, 900 or so employees. Um, and uh, they were purchased by Pitney Bowes, which was a $5.7 billion Fortune 300 company. And both companies by themselves had completely different cultures. Mm -hmm. So one company was around for 82 years and um, had sort of, they don't like to use the word monopoly, but really had a monopoly um, in, in their business and, and was able to really generate a lot of cash, which allowed them to focus on whatever they wanted to focus on. Sure. Where MapInfo was sort of a smaller um, public software company that was always on the edge, had to win every quarter, right? So the people, we had to have good people in order to do that, and it was very competitive. Well, soon after the acquisition, they decided, we want to have a billion dollar software business. We bought another public software company a couple of years ago. We want to merge uh, MapInfo with that and then have a $400 million business and, get, and try to get to a billion. So you think about, now you're talking about at least three different cultures and they're all completely different. The other public software company was made up of probably 13 different acquisitions that they never integrated. So there was separate cultures within there. So that was probably the biggest challenge. All of a sudden, somehow we had to figure out how to come together. Right? And um, change isn't easy. I don't know about you, but I don't think any of us wake up in any day and say, today's the day I'm going to change. Right? I'm going to change how I drive, drive to work. I'm going to change my friends. Right? I'm going to change my job. Th those aren't easy, easy things for people to do because um, change is difficult. Sure. And usually we need some kind of catalyst to have that change. So now all of a sudden we have to try to tell 2,000 people that the way they've been doing things for a while and how they've been doing it is going to change. Mm -hmm. And so I think in order to do that you have to have a catalyst. And so um, we sort of created uh, the, the, um, the outlook of how if things trended as they were, how much trouble we'd be in. We talked about some of the competitive pressures and we were able to, it, and it's funny because it's a balance, you have to um, spook people and scare people enough to want to change, but at the same time you have to make them feel good that you have a new journey to go upon. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the secret. So you have to really work on a vision of what you're trying to accomplish. And so, um, because without that, it's, it's just going to be a lot of running around. So that's one of the things we really focus on. What's the strategy? What's the vision? How do these pieces fit? Um, and then trying to win over, and sometimes you feel like you're winning it over a person at a time. So if, if um, we have folks in the audience that are, or, and I say audience, and I don't just mean our local audience because this is going to go up on the, the global website, but I, I'm a business owner and I'm saying, yeah, you know, I, I really need to institute some change. You talked about a few things. You talked about there needs to be a strategy. Before there's a strategy, there needs to be a vision. So how can a, um, you know, a business owner, uh, whether they're an entrepreneur or a small business owner or perhaps a large business owner, how do you go about um, the vision hopefully is coming from the mission statement that that's in place, but then how do you bring, how do you enact that and bring that into place? Well, if you deal with a lot of entrepreneurs, many times um, they bring about the vision themselves, right? They're, they're the ones that come up with the idea and where the business will go. Now the thing about also the other edge of that coin, the other side of that coin, is that the entrepreneur sometimes is grabbing too many visions, right? And is constantly changing their vision. So they're, they're grabbing this shiny object and then when they see this other shiny one, they'll let that one go. And that can be tough on a staff, because now a tech staff is working on this, now they have to change and work on that, and you have trouble getting momentum, all right? So certainly it's about focus. A vision is, is more about what you aspire to be, is not who you are today, so a mission statement. What are we, who do we serve today? What's our value proposition? Who's our customers and so forth? Where with a vision statement, you're really trying to describe what you're gonna be five, five years from now, right? So, um, you know, what do our employees think about us? It's, it's good that it's a uh, sort of 360 degree view of your business. So what do our employees think? What do our customers think? Um, how are we viewed um, by our competitors? Um, what makes us special? You know, how does our technology being used and our product line and so forth? So the, the more words you can put around that and even better a picture, right, um, helps people understand what you're trying to accomplish. You said the shiny, and it just made me think of that term I hear, the shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Um, that uh, is the bane, perhaps, of an entrepreneur because, you know, to be an entrepreneur, you, you, you've got that, um, you're a little crazy, basically, to, 
to want to own, to start your own business. There has to be a little bit of a, a nuts that's that's kind of built into that. But how, you know, to, um, to not get um, distracted by those shiny things, it, talk, it, it sounds like you're saying that the vision is part of it. Um, but as a new entrepreneur, would you say that really finding that target, who, who is your, there's a problem that you're trying to solve, that's why you started your business. Yeah. Would you say that finding um, who that target is saves a lot of, you kind of know where to shoot your, your rocket? Yeah, and, and that's always going to change, right? So I think the biggest thing to do is you go out and learn, and you test, and you talk, and you come back and make changes, and you go out and test and talk and make changes and keep doing that. I think um, one of the things that's important is uh, we, we tend to label anybody that starts something an entrepreneur. And um, many times, um, there's a difference between the inventor and the innovator and the person that can commercialize the business, mm -hmm. right? And so those are different skills. Uh, it's hard to find the same person that has those skills. So you'll see a lot of businesses that, are, that can get some good traction and go quicker is because they've taken some time and they've got a team of people with some different skills and they understand how to work together. Um, and so you've got the idea person, but then you've also got that the person knows how to commercialize and knows how to about bring, bringing focus, knows about how to identify the market the opportunities, right, and, and make those things happen. That sounds, there was a book that I read recently, it's an older book, <coughs> e -Myth, um, where the, uh, I think it's Michael Gerber's the author, I know his last name is Gerber, but he talks about the technician is the person who has that skill, whether it's a baker or that's the person, the innovator, that can do it. And that many small businesses fail because you think, I can do this thing, but it has nothing, that's a completely different skill from, as you're saying, running to business, running a business or managing the business, but that it's important to get, um, either to develop in yourself those abilities to, to be able to run the business or to build a team around you that is able. How, how would a company um, go about doing that, to, to get that, to build that? How did you do that? Well, you know, I think everybody's different. I think from a leadership perspective, it starts with you have to have a little humility, right? And so you have to recognize what your strengths and weaknesses are. And, and you really have to be devoted to accomplishing things as a team and um, understanding that you need to bring people on the board that don't have the same skills that you do. Uh, I, I think often um, in our hurry to try to be successful in things, we think we can do it all. And especially, um, I think the younger you are, I, I got to tell you, when I was younger, I thought you couldn't tell me anything. All right? I, I thought I knew it all, and it's only you know now that I've gotten older, I recognized how much I didn't know back then. Sure. Right? But it was probably some of that stubbornness and persistence, right. you know, also helped me yeah. from a career perspective. Right. So that was that was actually going to be one. Of my I things. had more confidence than I deserved to have. <laughs> More confidence, perhaps, than the experience to undergird right. the confidence. Yeah. I eventually grew into my confidence. <laughs> so that was, you know, that was going to be a question. You know, um, you have been a serial entrepreneur in addition to all the, the things that you've done with, with, with some of these other companies you know, that you've started and sold, um, you know, over, t you know, more than 10 companies. So as a business owner, what was surprising to you? What you, you talked about, and maybe that's, what was something that you were like, oh, didn't expect that? Well, let me, so let me just uh, make sure we have the right context. So I, I wouldn't actually call myself an entrepreneur. I would call okay. myself an entrepreneur. Okay. So um, I, I've always wanted to start my own company. I never did it. Right, so we go back to those skill things that we talk about. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of guts, right? And so some of you in the audience have done that. That's that's a great skill to be able to do that. I was always a change agent at the companies I worked for. I always brought new ideas, new things forward. I always pushed pushed things, try to transform. Um, and so I use that skill and that uh, sort of appetite I have to do it inside company walls um, from that perspective. Um, now I bought businesses. I, had, I only sold one, and that was Map Info, and there was a bunch of us that sold that. So, right. um, but over the years, you know, I, I bought probably ten or twelve businesses, and they were all I would consider entrepreneurial. They weren't large businesses. They were in the ten to thirty million dollar range. As we started to look to get some different expertise in different markets, we started to to uh, look at acquisition as an easier way to do that. Okay. So. so um Talk a little bit about, uh, I was reading someplace that growing a business, it, it, that $1 million seems to be um, uh, just a figure, like, oh, when I make my first million. But I understand, um, and I'm asking this is a question, is it true, that it's whatever it takes to kind of get to that first million, or to get to that 10 million mark, or 100 million mark, and really ramping it up from that point, 
Is it the same skills? Are you going to be using, say, the, the team that you use to get to your first million, are they going to be as effective to get you? Because I would imagine that things have changed culture-wise and the needs of the company. Right. They can be. Often they're not. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that bigger companies struggle with is, is they want to be more entrepreneurial. They want to um, you know, have new projects that start and get off the ground. <clears throat> and the complexities of their new company, their larger company, and their regulations, and their rules, and their policies, and their structures, um, and the business processes all get in the way of that. Okay. Right? And sometimes, um, uh, some people, you'll find people that will go from one startup, right? And then if the company gets bought by a bigger one, they're like, I'm out of here, right? Because mm -hmm. they like that, that mm -hmm. freedom, mm -hmm. right? That ability to adjust quickly and things like that. Now, at the same time, um, if companies could get out of their own way, the larger companies, those are exact type of skills they need in their business. But um, I think leadership has to do a good job of carving out those opportunities. Um, so one of the things that you know we used to do is sort of um, sort of new startups within the company, right? And so yeah, it's a different set of rules, and you let them do different things. And, um, I think that's a clever way of trying to be more entrepreneurial as a bigger business. I call it organizational arthritis, right? So the longer you've been around, the more layers you have, the more functions, the more silos, you're just creating more opportunity for your organization not to work effectively together. And how you, you seem to have been uh, very effective in, in kind of, you know, you talked about bringing together, and, and you, you said it kind of quickly, and then I'm, I'm sort of realizing that the way that you were able to help all of those different, each of these little uh, silos of cultures come together, and that's um, to, to really be able to help them to maximize on what each of them, I mean, would you say that that's something that was intuitively you? Was it something that you learned along the way? Was that something education um, or a combination? Yeah, it's probably a little bit of all that. I think part of it is you have to put yourself in other people's shoes, and you have to understand so one of the things I learned when we were acquiring companies is, is no matter what you did about talking about strategy and synergies and all these great things we're going to do, at the end of the day that employee says, well, what about me? What's going to happen to my pay? What's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to my benefits? Right? And you learn that pretty quickly of you better have answers for that right away because that's the number one thing that they share for. So you really have to you know, quickly get in and understand you know, what's driving them, what their concerns about, what, what gets them excited, you know, where they've been, what, what they want to do, and so forth. So it really is um, not just a, it can't just be a top heavy uh, decision making that takes place where the leadership is saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. But if you begin to forget about Some companies do it that way, right? So they'll do, um, they'll have very disciplined integration processes and everything gets done the same way and so forth. Uh, I believe that um, when you bought a company, each integration is sort of like a snowflake, a little bit unique. And I think you have to go in and you have to look at um, you know, what's driving that company, you have to really understand the culture and the people. Because um, most of the time businesses we, we bought, that was really important. And the last thing we wanted to do was buy a company and have half the people leave, right? So we were very careful about that. And we, really tried, we actually used to um, test the, the companies uh, on their culture. So we actually had this um, a way of trying to understand and map out and look at what a culture looked like. It's hard to believe, but there actually is tools that let you do that. Now, what we often found was the management team painted one picture and then the employees painted a different yeah. picture. And many times they wouldn't let us talk to the employees left, we buy it, and that's what we find out. <laughs> okay. Different pictures. Okay. Yeah, so it's really, um, I think, um, you have to design what, what do you have to integrate now? Because some things just have to be done. Uh, what things maybe you don't have to integrate, we can integrate later, or what things you shouldn't even bother integrating. So I think, I think it has to be unique. So it's going to depend on on in the, on the individual settings for each company. Right. What, what were some uh, another? Um... And that's just my opinion. So, right. but I, there's some companies that are really successful. Like, this is what we do. Boom, boom, we cut the cord and all this stuff, and we integrate everything right away. So it's a nope. sink or swim sort of. A, yeah, I, I mean, think Oracle's approach is we want the customers and products. We don't necessarily care about the employees, <laughs> and they cut a lot of employees right away, and they th take the brand and the products, and and when, and financially that has worked for them. But financial, uh, it, it would seem, is not always an indicator of the success. Uh, kind of the outside looks nice, but you know, rotting from the inside out. If if it's, uh, it just seems like that would be quite a drain if you're consistently having to replace your employees. But I guess if you're a big enough company like Oracle, 
Um, they pay well, so they can always find people that are willing to work. <laughs> so, if, if, again, if, if a business is wanting to, um, I know one of the things that also um, you've done with companies that have um, an international component to it. So, it's one thing to manage a staff of folks that are um, in, a, in, a, in the U.S. the U.S. country. The culture is, you know, the culture. Uh, talk about branching that out into uh, international relations and still keeping so the culture looks the same. Yeah. So there's um, there's a corporate there's a business culture right, and then there's the uh, the country culture, mm -hmm. which is always different. So you always have to you have to understand those type of things, understand, and you know sort of the old saying when in Rome do as the Romans do, mm -hmm. right? So um, we always made sure we pulled our management together multiple times during the year. Um, we when we held customer conferences, we would do global customer conferences. When we hold partner conferences, we bring all our partners from around the world. And, and that was really so you could be consistent in how you're branding and, and trying to talk about a, the map infos culture and therefore them as an extension of that, right, so that they can understand that. Uh, but it's, it is always still a work in progress. That's just something you have to pay attention to every day. It, you'll never, ever be 100% right, but when you stop paying attention to it is when you get in trouble. So it's just sort of something you have to have on your everyday to-do list, you know. So if a company is interested, um in, in moving abroad, there's really a lot of work that has to be done on the back end before you can even think about expanding into uh, another country. And there's always new, these nuances like, um, you know, the English don't like taking orders from the Americans and the French don't like taking orders from the English and, uh, and the Germans don't like taking orders from the English and you got to understand how all those things play out. Okay. So as a, um, some of the things that we, when we first started talking, uh, you said that the, the acquisition and the merger was, was very complicated. What were some, um, you know, obstacles that, not perhaps from your, from your experience, but uh, what are some things that a business owner in that acquisition process can look to be, that you, this is going to be something that you're going to have to overcome, or what was something that you found as your company needed to overcome, like an obstacle? Part of, being a, uh, part of being an, an entrepreneur is overcoming obstacles. Is well, I think the mean? whole thing was an obstacle. <laughs> because it was such a dramatic change in culture mm -hmm. um, that it was, uh, you were trying, while you're trying to win out in the competitive marketplace every day, you're really just putting your fingers in all the holes trying to hold it together, right? Because um, people didn't like a lot of things that were going on. They didn't like a lot of the changes, you know. Um, almost every change was being taken negatively, right? So there was a lot of mistrust and animosity being built up almost on a daily basis. So that, and it's because the change is swift, it's hard, um, sometimes there doesn't seem to be reason or logic behind decisions that are being made. Decisions are being made somewhere remotely. So, I mean, this isn't a new story, unfortunately. Um, you hear many people that sell their business and have intentions to stay around, and they can't. It's sure. just, they sort of watch the business sort of, um, Change. They feel like they're part of trying to change something they built, and they have a difficult time doing that. So how, how I mean... And, co and companies tend to buy something because it's different, sure. and they value that different, mm -hmm. but then can't get out of their own way of trying to make it just like they are. Mm -hmm. okay. and that's one of the challenges. That's human nature, I guess. So that was, that was something. There was, was there a particular incident or um, something that just sticks in your mind like, yeah, like was there, was there ever a time during that transition, and, it, and I know that was a, it was a time consuming, that you said, yeah, not so much. I'm, I'm kind of ready to throw the towel in on this one. Um, this is being taped, right? So I can't <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of this. Uh, they sort of built up over time. Uh, okay. I mean, I think initially there's, you know, there's excitement when somebody says to me, Mike, we want you to, to run this combined business and build a billion, a billion dollar software business, right? That's got some excitement to it, right? And as you're building your team, you're looking for some acquisitions and things like that. Um, the, the parent company was struggling financially. Its market was, um, you know, it was being replaced by a digital marketplace. Um, they didn't have some products in place to overcome that. And so uh, each quarter was such financial pressure on uh, the cash flow of the organization that um, it was just quarterly cuts. Sure. And I think the thing that frustrated me was that there was not a portfolio approach to that. So it's not like, well, let's not cut from our growth. Mm -hmm. It was a, everybody's got to share the pain approach. Mm, okay. And so, um, you know, you were just laying people off every quarter just because 
you know, I was just that so was that, a, was the, that, that was the that was the one that sort of built up, and at one point I said that's that's enough. Yeah, I can't yeah. Do that now, uh, another one, one of your other things that you do is you are a consultant uh, to executives in the, the banking yes. group. So was that kind of built from, um, did you just realize that, or it, the evidence showed that you just had a, a skill, or you had people, was it more of a mentor thing where people began to approach you for you to help them kind of? Yeah, so before I went to Map Info, I was with a company called Allied Signal, which was run by Larry Bossi, who was Jack Welch's right hand man at GE for a while. And it's now Honeywell. And while I was there, I was there about a decade, and so I got to participate um, in, at the time I think they called it the 2% Club, but it was basically, um, we were rolling out total quality management, much like General Electric was. And so I was one of those uh, people, besides your regular job, um, you sort of went on SWAT teams to go fix other businesses and, and, and do that. So I got certified in total quality management and I became a master. So I was doing a lot of like internal consulting inside of Allied Signal for years, kind of like that, right? Kind of like going to some different locations. And you know, the, the funny thing was you, um, the problems were different, yet they're all always the same to a degree. And so when you, you learn the process and the tools to attack it, you basically could tell the people the outcomes before you even start working on the project. And they say you were crazy, and at the end of it, everybody's slapping everybody in the back because they had problems. Mm -hmm. so, so it was kind of a neat, neat learning process. And so from that, um, you would then separate out into the, the Hickey group. Well, that was a long time ago. So that was that was um, 80s and, and early 90s. Okay. And so I just knew I had that in me. I, there was one point in time I also wanted to. You know, when I was younger, I thought about teaching and stuff. So I think I've always had that act, that, that part of me that wanted, wanted, to, wanted kind of to do that. So, to do that. And my consulting business is pretty specific. It was um, strategy, consulting, and executive coaching. So. Okay. Okay. One of the things I know um, that you are uh, very skilled at doing um, is helping to increase revenue within it. Obviously, you, you did that quite well within the company. If, if someone wanted to do that for their business. They, are there particular strategies strategies that you would say are kind of, it doesn't matter what the industry are, that a, a person, if they, they're saying, you know, I just would like to really increase the revenue of my company. Yeah. What are some things that I can look to do or, or learn or point to to kind of move in that direction? Well, um, so that's a tricky answer. I think um, it's different for everybody. Okay. The, probably the biggest thing is you have to, you can't cheat the process. You have to put your work in up front. Um, it's going to be cheaper that way, and in the end, you're going to get to where you want to get to. But mm -hmm. so what do I mean by that? You, you, you really have to understand uh, who, who's going to be interested in what you're trying to sell, mm -hmm. right? Or whether it's a product extension or a new product. You have to understand what they're going to want to pay for it. You have to understand how many of them there are. You have to understand your channel for getting out there and what you're going to price it for. If you're going to have to you know, have a channel in the middle, what are you going to have to make sure that the margins are right for everybody? Um, and so you have to do that, you really have to do that work up front. With bigger companies, the problem always is um, nobody can do anything new, right, because they say they don't have enough money. Like I remember one year I got fed up with everybody telling me that they don't have money, they don't have money. And I was like, we have $300 million. That's enough money to do a lot of things. And so um, that's when we started, um, as part of our planning process, what we started doing was I made every department identify um, divest your opportunities. So it wasn't, we were just picking on one, everybody had to do it. And so you would basically um, identify the bottom 10% of your budget thing that you, if you had to, you could divest. And so what we used to do with that is that's how we would fund new, new revenue growth. Because um, we would look at what we would need and we, we'd take some, somebody we might take 10% from, somebody else might be in a growth business and we'd take nothing from. Right, but it, it forced everybody to have to come to the table and understand that. And then that became part of the culture, right? And it was easy, but um, but that goes. That's how you free up. It's unbelievable how binding a three hundred million dollar budget can be, where people say, "I have no money." Right. Um, right. Um, it is because we always want to keep doing the same things we're doing, even though they may not work anymore. So it, it sounds as if that actually, like you say, it, it became almost second thinking. So. Maybe it was new seeming at first and painful at first, but then I would imagine that those yeah, it was really were... painful at first because everybody tries to play games and uh, well, I don't I couldn't come up with ten I only come up with four and then you say well if we put your salary in you're up to ten here we right. go right. after a while you, people you began to be able to look at their own yeah. and, and almost do it for themselves 
and that it seems like that would kind of generate. Um, it, it seems like it would, it would almost give you that that creative way of looking at. You have to do. Um, I think you have to do it because you have to have renewed focus and the innovation in the business, and that's why big businesses struggle with innovation. I mean, um, we all think about Google and how, how that was built on innovation, um, but as they got bigger and that organizational arthritis, they also started to struggle with innovation. Right? So you have to do things differently. Um, talk about mentors. Is that something, I know that you were, uh, you were probably sought out quite a bit uh, to mentor. Were there people um, that you could think of that were really helpful to you in your journey? Yeah, yeah. I think there was a, a, a gentleman who I worked for for uh, a while in uh, when I was with Outline Signal that I learned a lot from, um, and uh, a lot of you know funny stories there. Um, but uh, you know, he was someone who, for some reason, we just clicked, and um, I thought he was a smart guy, and you know, and, uh, he helped me a lot in his early career perspective. He gave me a lot of opportunities. And things like that. And that's it. Sounds like that's something that you are now. You know, like I think of your. Um, you're what you're doing at Siena, uh, and to me that that's like you're you're you know really helping build the entrepreneurs for tomorrow. Well, I won't say tomorrow because it's today. I know you're kind of uh, growing them. Um, so we have young people at Siena that are learning about uh, learning about business, learning about entrepreneurship. Is that um, from a, I should say from an academic standpoint, they're they're doing some real world stuff as well, um, but also getting that uh, academic undergirding. Mm -hmm. And is that something? Um, that differed really from the path that you had? Was yours more business experiential that you learned from? Or did you also have that kind of a founding from, from education as well? Uh, well, I, I'd probably get in trouble if I said I had no foundation. <laughs> so I'd like to think my degree was worth something. So it's probably a little bit of both. But I think, um, you know, you tend to you learn by doing. Yeah, you know? yeah. And as we, I always say, failure is underrated. Sure, you learn a lot sure. more from failing than, than you do success sometimes. Sure. You know? Sometimes what success does to you is just give you a big head and too much confidence, and then that allows you to be blindsided by the next thing. Right? This is, it's interesting. Um, this is my seventh, I believe, this is my seventh interview. And it's, I'm always curious about, because um, people fall out on, on different sides, whether they think, you know, it's, it's, you kind of get in the trenches and you kind of learn it that way. And some are like, well, you know, it's helpful to have a little bit of education. Uh, I had one speaker who said that, um, in terms of starting a business or being an entrepreneur, when you are fresh out of college, you really don't have the experience to, you've got education. You've got education, but you don't, unless you've been something, a sort of a situation like that in the program that you're in, um, that graduates, new graduates often don't have that, but they think they do. Right. Um, some of the things that I've heard about, uh, some of the startup weekends, um, there are a lot of pitches in our area, there seem to be a lot of pitches around mobile apps. Um, that I'm going to make a mobile app and I'll sell it to, you know, you know, 10 zillion people are going to download that yeah. app. And it's almost like that, that resiliency of youth, which is, you need it as an entrepreneur. But there's also perhaps a little bit of, uh, you know, nette, just a being There is, there is. And because that, I, I see a lot of those apps as well. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, so there's, that's a sword with two sides, right? right. So on one side, there's that thing that they're excited about being an entrepreneur, they're thinking about these things, um, but the other side of that is they really don't have the practical experience and you know, they don't uh, recognize how, how unique it is to be successful in one of those things, right? right. We always, we remember that, um, the Facebook example, mm -hmm. or, um, and, but we forget about all the ones that failed. Mm -hmm. right? And um, even during the dot-com bubble, people were quitting jobs were getting paid good money to go for a startup because they're hearing all these stories of, sure. of people making money, but they were hearing the, the 3 4% stories, they weren't hearing the 95 96% sure. stories, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's a, like anything, it's a mix, right? And, and what you see your typical entrepreneurs are actually, uh, I think the average age of your typical entrepreneurs in your early 40s, right? So what does that tell you? It's something about getting some experience, right, that goes along. So as a youth, you have that energy and you have that persistence and you have that will, but you don't yet have the experience. And it's not as much education as it is about learning. Mm -hmm. And right, so some kids do great learning going sure. to college, some kids don't. Mm -hmm. Some kids go to college and still don't learn. Sure, you know? sure. Um, but it's about those learnings and then putting them into practice. I've actually, uh, a couple of my students that have all the will in the world and they want to start a company, but they really don't have an idea. Right, um, and then they'll talk about a space. I said, you know what? Go work for a company in that space for a while. 
get to know the industry, get to know the company, you know, get to know the competition, um, and then your idea will become better, you'll have more experience, and you'll be able to do something with it. And I think that, that again, speaks to the, almost the mentorship thing, because you, you go in, you get, you, it, it'll, it'll kind of take off that veneer of um, kind of the fantasy portion of it. It's like, I think it's like this, but if I actually take the time to go and work for a company, I'm going to be getting that hands-on experience and think, wow, this is really nothing like what I thought it was going to be at all, and maybe maybe it's not maybe it's not exactly um, what I want. So there's a, there's a, there's it, a It's hard. Of, you don't have the experience. You don't have the capital, right? And uh, um, so and you just have to start paying bills at some point. So that's it's hard to start when you're young like that. To try and find that balance. Um, what about community engagement in terms of um, there? Are, I know that there are a lot of companies um, that are in a kind of a in a, in a giving back either. Um, the owners themselves are, you know, philanthropic, mm -hmm. or they've actually built. I know um, uh, have built something into there where they actually have a dedicated part of their company that is focused on community engagement. How does that fit in with what you know what you found over the years? Well, um, I know our company, and then also Pitney Bowes does encourage their executives and stuff to get involved in the community and, and be part of those type of things. Uh, I, I liked. Um, from the standpoint of bridging with entrepreneurship, um, you know, what better way to help a community than create jobs? And so I, uh, one of the things, in fact, um, that we're working on through the CEG project and the, the strategic pillar around an entrepreneur ecosystem is, is sort of that enterprise engagement of getting those successful companies more involved to help those, those companies that maybe are smaller and, and need some help, whether it's uh, mentors, whether it's lab space, whether it's actually possibly doing business with some of those Companies, because most big companies are risk averse when it comes to doing business with the smaller companies. So uh, I look at that as, as a, uh, also a form of community engagement by companies, right? And by joining If them. they're able to help create jobs, that's, really, that's one of the best things you can do for your right, community. Right, right. And I, I understand that, you know, small businesses, you, you wouldn't think of it. You think of, sometimes I think you think of big name companies, those ones that easily come to mind, but actually it's small businesses. <laughs> I'm understanding that are really contributing to the economy that, that make up the bulk yeah. of the business. Small business drives the economy of the U.S. The tail is is, is larger, right? They always said the long tail, right? And um, I think all new net job growth over the last 35 years comes from from businesses that are less than five years old, which means they're start you know, young startups. So I, and I know that um, you know being chair of uh, CEG, you, CEG is, and I'm just learning a little bit. I'm just kind of my. Um, connection with CEG is very new and very fledgling, so I'm just beginning to learn more about uh, what they, you know, what they're doing and what they're. But I know that they have been involved in the whole Tech Valley um, from the beginning, from its inception. They were really very instrumental in, in helping that to, to come into play. So I am looking forward to learning more about, you know, what CEG is is offering um, because I know that they also have a, a real big impact in, in what the entrepreneur scene or the startup scene is doing. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions for folks, but is there anything that you wanted to share? Um, you know, I, I wanted to touch a little bit about on business growth and the business strategy and the revenue increasing and those are things. Um, what, what is it that you love about being a business owner? What is something, I talked about some things that were surprising to you. What, what, what would be, you said something that's like, yep, this is why I get up in the morning and why I like doing what I'm doing. It's all changed that the business leader probably yeah. it's in the business yeah. owner, and it's, it, it really is um, winning with a group of people that you like. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, when you can create a vision and build a team, and then you go out and do it, there's nothing better than that. So a long time ago, my I, you know if I could have played major league baseball or football or basketball, I would have done that, but um, my body didn't allow me to do that. So uh, I have to pick business, but um, I'm just as competitive about business though. So I take the same type of approach. So you. You go on the field, you go on the court, and you try to win with your teammates. And so you're, before you get out there, you're trying to surround yourself with teammates that are, each have the, the skill set that are going to complement and uh, create the winning team. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Okay, great. You can't scale, um, business, uh, one person can't scale a business. Mm -hmm. You can't. And, and that's what I find last times when I'm, I'm trying to help entrepreneurs. Um, it's the it's sometimes the CEO is part of the problem because they have to touch everything, mm -hmm. and that's not scalable, right? So you're always going to be that size. Sure, you're not going to grow. Right? You have to have you have to hire good people, and you have to allow them 
to be able to do the work, and that's how the business is going to grow. What do you think that is about that, that entrepreneurial mindset? Is it just the newness of it, that feeling like, or because it's, they're so wedded to the, the concept of what the business is? What have you seen? It seems to be. You know, I don't know if I have an answer for what, why. Mm -hmm. I just know we see a lot. It is. <laughs> yeah, it just it is. Not all the time, but you, right. see it, you do see it a lot. A lot. And, and not just entrepreneurs. You know what? Not just even entrepreneurs. Now, the problem is, in, and not the problem, the solution in regular companies, you have a lot of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. Right? So, okay. if you're working and you're a manager in a company, you've got peers, you've got, you've got HR, you've got this and that. Sure. When you're an entrepreneur, you're sort of the king or queen, right? And so, everybody has to answer to you. So, I think you don't have the check and balances, probably. Okay. Delusions of grandeur. Yeah. That's exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and let's face it, part of the reason, um, you know, it's their persistence and their confidence and their risk-taking ability is, sure. you know. It's kind of what got them started got in, the, there, right? so in the first place. It's hard for them to ignore those things. That's, those are their strengths. So it's almost, it's almost knowing, being wise enough to know the balance of, yes, you have a viable business idea, and yes, it's great, but you are not going to be able to do it by yourself, and you have to be able to listen and take advice from, um, from those who can advise you, who perhaps have been there, and also be wise enough to put people around you that can do those things and then trust enough yeah. to let go of the reins, to let those people that you put in place kind of do what they do best. It's a good sum up. Yeah. You were listening. I was listening. I was listening. So I, but I did want to open it up uh, for questions. Um, is there anyone that has questions that they would like to ask Mike? Tracy, I would ask a question. Um, Thank you for taking the time. That was really nice. There's this industry of what I call solo, it's not my word, solopreneurs. People working independently. And I know I am one, and I know a ton. I am one representing other women who needed flexibility to be a mother and created something that would allow me to do that. And now I'm like a consultant. And you know, and I don't want a business. Yeah, All that yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> that right. you talked about, yeah. I don't want. Do you see a role for this growing group of people, people who lost their job? You, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Do you see a role for them integrating into this business model that you're talking about, which is the combination um, of, you know, the picking bones with the map info, bringing it in? I mean, is it, do, you, do you see it as like a standard consulting role? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it, you know, the, the solopreneurs who are all over yeah. the place doing things, do you see a role using them in these businesses? Oh, in the businesses. Have? Yeah. Well, I think it always comes down to the person and what their skill set is, mm -hmm. right? So uh, even in our business, we had people that worked, um, they called them individual contributors because they actually uh, were smart, worked hard, Right, but sometimes had trouble playing in the sandbox with the other kids. Okay, right? you can say that about me. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah. but, and, but they had a lot of value they bring, so that you'd have to then be able to create a role where that works, right? And, and sometimes you can create those roles, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't have too many of those roles, or you have a bunch of individual people not working together. Um, and that's another. Lots of times, that's another reason why someone becomes an entrepreneur is they don't, um, you know, they don't want to have a boss. They want to be the boss, and they want to run things. That's great. You know, mm -hmm. and you should and you should do that if that's how you feel. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the question is related to before you talked about so sort of the acquisitions only made when you were in the Met, at the FOMO, but then when you were acquired and you got by a huge corporation and they kept moving to the chairs every day, um, and uh, if you were now to go back in an environment similar to MapInfo, where you were looking to make acquisitions or maybe someone's looking to acquire, how would your lens be different today based on your Pitney Bowes experience? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I think I even take a stronger view about, um, about those things I talked about with the culture and what to integrate and not integrate. Um, I, I, we came up with that as a team just from experiences, right? It was recognizing um, we make one, it's like, all right, what worked, what didn't work? Um, and then doing some benchmarking on what some other companies were doing. And then we came up with our own own way of doing things. And, and it got better every one we did. Right? And in the beginning, we didn't do that at all. And then towards the end, we were doing it pretty well. 
So um, I think I actually probably had those learnings prior to Pitney Bowes. I think it's just, um, so I've actually consulted on a couple companies that have gotten bought in the last couple of years, and that's the advice I've given them is, you, you're gonna be okay with the fact <coughs> that it is not your company anymore. And it might feel good to look at that check, but recognize there's an emotional side to that too, right? That um, it's gonna be difficult for you to manage, and, and this is what's coming. And it always comes, right? It's just, because that's the way the world works. Um, they're going to they're going to make changes. They're going to want to run it differently. You're not going to make decisions that you used to make, and, um, and that will keep changing and changing. Right? So you either how I what I tell people is um, treat it like you've just left your old job and now you're interviewing for this new job. You have to look at it that way. Um, and would you want to work for this new company? Would you want to do this job and take this paycheck? If not, go. You know, in fact, at one point I had to say that um, through our transition because I liken it to everybody standing around the train station, but nobody gets on a train, right? And there's just a lot of loitering going on, right? And then, you know, what happens is because there's too many people, there's loitering, there's fights, right? So um, at some point, you have to get on a train. It's leaving the station. And uh, you have to make that, each person has to make that decision individually. And it's, and it's easier said than done. I can preach all I want about it, but it was it's a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Jeff, over there. Oh. Did you, did you? Uh, so for a lot of the young folks that I talk with about business, my peers, um, there's a lot of hype and interest in worker cooperatives and kind of business models and business cultures that I guess have more horizontal form decision making, profit sharing. Um, and I'm curious if you have any ideas about I don't know, because there's a way in which I think, I used to talk a lot about youth, but me and people I know have been caught up in a kind of hype around that. I'm curious if, if there's our drawbacks that you recognize, but also maybe some like strengths. I don't know, any thoughts you have? Because it's, it's a bit different, I think. It sounds different. Yeah, well, no, so that's, that's the culture. I understand that culture. And, and in fact, earlier days, Map Info was very similar to that culture. But I think what happens, um, I think that culture gets harder and harder to maintain if you're trying to really grow the business, mm -hmm. right? Because um, sooner or later, uh, to make decisions based on consensus um, can get challenging, right? Because you're going to have multiple agendas that won't work together. And sooner or later, somebody's got to make the call on those type of things. So I think that's great from a startup perspective in early year, early days. Um, and I would just say it's probably going to change unless the company wants. It's okay staying a certain size, which is okay too. Right? Um, if everybody's making a good living off it and everybody enjoys working together, you know, then maybe you don't want to grow the business because you're going to get a bunch of new challenges that come with that, right? So that's okay. But once you make the decision that you want to grow and if you want to sell it or any of those type of things, or if you want to go public, um, it's, it's almost impossible to maintain that type of culture. How do you balance uh your busy work life and leadership responsibilities without home life successfully? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we all talk about life-work balance, and it's usually, uh, um, at any given time, it's usually a complete imbalance, right? So that's one of the reasons I decided to stop doing what I was doing was I felt like um, I was really out of balance. You know, I was waking up in hotel rooms in different countries forgetting where I was and, you know, they take a plane from one country to, to a meeting, to a next country to a meeting. My calendar by January, by the end of January, was filled up for the whole year. So if I wanted to take a day to go skiing or, you know, if my, my son or daughter had a game or something, it was tough. My, my schedule was filled. So uh, when I made a decision to leave, that was really the thing that drove me, is I wanted to flip it the other way and be able to spend more time with my family. I tried really hard, and I think I probably did okay. Um, but the as they always say, uh, on your deathbed, nobody says, gee, I wish I spent more time at work, right? So mm -hmm. you get a certain age where all of a sudden you know, that becomes a lot more clear to you. And obviously I passed that age. Matt <laughs> <laughs> uh, Benfo has been one of the sort of star successes of the you know, last couple of decades, um, emergence of tech in this region. Um, but there hasn't been a whole lot of other um, comparables. 
I just wonder what you think, how you think this region either contributes or doesn't contribute uh, as, a, as an environment, um, not just to do a startup, quick startup, but to uh, mature a business. Yeah, so I think um, you could say that about a lot of regions around the country. Yeah. Um, everybody wants, there's a lot of wannabes. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things that I think you see the regions that are successful, it's the successful entrepreneurs get involved in helping for, um, to create more successful entrepreneurs. And to, so to your point, I actually I think our region gets a little bad rap about the lack of success. I think, um, I, I forget the exact number, but if you go back over the last decade, um, I think there's over $5 billion or something in transactions of businesses that have been sold and stuff in the area. So. Uh, I think we need to do a better job of marketing that. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenges that we have here about creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem, I, I participated in President Clinton's global initiative a couple of years ago on the entrepreneurship team, and uh, it was just amazing to me. I don't care what, whether it was Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Los Angeles, Albany, everybody had the same problems, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there does, does seem to me, um, I've only been involved really in the entrepreneur area for the last five, six years or so, but it seems like to me there's a lot more noise, right? There's a lot more activity. Um, and um, the key to it is how do we get the capital? How do we get the mentors? How do we get those successful entrepreneurs to, to contribute to making that noise become something? Anyone else? For the Albany area generally, you know, major markets, there's just such a institutionalized set of venture capital investors. And I'm yeah. a little bit up here. Is there, do you have any thoughts on kind of the type of investor that a business should take on? Is it kind of, you know, whatever the biggest dollar figure is? Or is there more to that intangibles that a business should be looking about thinking about? Bring someone to the well, I think there, it's a partnership, whether we want to look at it or not, right? Um, so I think, uh, especially about how much money you're going to take if you're taking a lot of money from someone, um, you have to understand how they like to operate if they give you that money. Some are more involved than others. Some demand things that others don't demand. Um, that's why if you can self-fund and do different things, you have a lot more freedom. Not only are you not giving away equity, but you're not giving away um, decision making as well, right? And so the more investors you get, the more pressure you're going to get to make decisions a certain way, to go down a certain path. At the same time, I think investors that have the connections in your marketplace, that have invested in similar uh, companies uh, as you in that industry, in that marketplace, can be really helpful because they can just pick up the phone many times and connect you with somebody you need to talk to that, <coughs> that would take you a year and a half to find. Right, so I think understanding those partners. If you obviously sometimes you only have one person that wants to give you money, and so that becomes a, uh, someone that you're interested in. But if you have a good business idea and you have some, you got to shop it around and, and and sort of really treat it like a partnership, like a marriage. Uh, you're you're picking the right investor, and and understand how they're going to do um, uh, follow-on rounds and stuff too. What their their history is with that, and who they partner with. Anyone else? Yes. Um, there's a huge gap between fresh out of college and building a, successfully building and leading multiple businesses. What, what was your, uh, where were you in your, say, in your 20s? You know, what, what's, what are those first steps? Where should somebody at that beginning stage be? Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of work getting from there to the point where you're confidently building businesses and leading businesses and knowing what you feel like your next step should be? You know, I, I've gotten that question before, especially by students who just want you to hand them sort of a roadmap of field you know, I know it's not that, but yeah. you know. Um, no, and I, I didn't mean to indicate that. It's just that I think for me it was recognizing where the finish line was. So I told earlier about um, my seventh grade social studies teacher said I, want, I told him I wanted to be a CEO in seventh grade. So I kind of, for some reason, I had that subconscious uh, end, end line that I was trying to get to. Um, and so, um, yeah, I started out, out of college, there was a recession. The only job I could get was selling. And so I sold insurance, I sold uh, business equipment, I sold anything I could sell. And actually did pretty good at it. Um, 
hated it, and, uh, but I learned a lot of lessons about how not to take no for an answer, right? How to, how to overcome objections, how to beat competition. You know, those are some simple skills, but they're huge because you use them for the rest of your business career. And then, you know, I, I also got kind of lucky. Allied Signal was a fantastic company to be a, a young manager in. The amount of training, uh, that whole experience with total quality management. <clears throat> Think about um, all the opportunities I got to go solve business problems at different companies that were part of the Allied Signal umbrella, but maybe different industries and so forth. Um, and to get that repetition of things and be able to apply a methodology that I was taught to it and see it work. That, builds up a lot of confidence. You basically know any problem I go in, I'm going to apply this methodology, and I know we're going to come out the other side okay, right? So that was kind of lucky that I got to work for a company like that. A lot of people don't have that opportunity. And I, would, I use those skills for the rest of my career, absolutely. Um, almost anything I did, you know, I always drew back and, and thought about things that way. Because I, I would I approach, when I say if I had to sum up um, as an executive, my approach, it is about teamwork and culture, it is about setting a vision, but then it's about executing on it. So I had, I was really big about business discipline, right? So doing things, doing things, uh, best practice, learning about best practices and keep making our process and our way of doing things better. So I think every journey, everybody's journey is a little different. So just take out of it an end line, where do you want to get to? Think about the skills that he needs to do that, and that there's a lot of different jobs you can do to get those skills, but recognize the skills that you're trying to get. Anyone else? Mike, I think we're clear. Thank you so much. This has been awesome.